Hey guys, my name is Ethan, and today we're going to walk you through our robot in three days for this first tech challenge season, Decode. For our robot in three days this year, we invited team 26949, the Royal Society of Robots from Norman, Oklahoma, up here to our headquarters in Kansas to put together this robot. Now, we were blown away by their last season in FTC. They were rookies last year, and they really took the starter bot and robot in three days resources that we put together last year and ran with them. They embodied what we want to see teams do with those resources by taking them and using them as inspiration and a starting point and just piling their own innovations on top. It was really special to see their season progress and for their robots to look less and less like the source material as the year went on and their season ended in winning an invitational and attending two premiere events. It was really special and I loved to work with them this year in creating this robot. Now, while we call it a robot in three days, it actually ends up being a robot in 15 hours. We live stream the entire process, and if you wanna watch every minute of building this robot, you can, it's up on YouTube under the archives for our live streams. Now, this severe time limit really limits the number of things that we can accomplish for this robot, and I think that's a good thing. It allows us to focus in on what's important and show you guys little snapshots of the engineering process that we like to take in creating FTC robots. The first step in that process for us is evaluating ways that we want to improve on the starter bot. We took our starter bot for this season, ran it around the field and drove it and said, hey, here are the places that we wish this was better. The first place that we evaluated improving was the drivetrain. Now the starter bot has a perfectly adequate drivetrain, but it is a skid steer, and that, that has a lot less mobility for teams than a mechanic drive option. Now this game in particular, I think is actually a game that benefits the least from mechanics in recent memory. This game is absolutely playable on a skid steer chassis, but we wanted that increased maneuverability, especially for parking in the base and for hitting that lever. I also think it could be very influential for defense and interacting with other robots as the season progresses, but in our robot in three days, that's a little bit harder to distinguish. The next place we wanted to improve on this robot was creating a ground intake. Now the starter bot works perfectly fine if you are always willing to feed it artifacts from the human player, but we feel like there's going to be a lot of advantage by allowing our robot to pick an element directly up off the ground and feed it right into the launcher. Those were kind of our two key takeaways from driving that robot in three days before we jumped into creating this robot. Now for the drivetrain, we started with a strafer chassis, which is a tradition at Robot in Three Days. And one way that we broke that tradition is that we actually left all of the motors horizontal in the channel. If you are a frequent, you see that we oftentimes stand those motors up to give us more space, but this year we felt like they were the most out of the way they could be laying down in the channel. And while if you go back and look at that stream, you'll see a lot of clips of this robot without those motors mounted. We put those in at the end and they just nested right in place in the drivetrain there. Now, another way that we diverted from the robot in three days tradition was that this is actually a stock size strafer chassis. It keeps the 10 hole crossbar and the 17 hole drive rail that you're used to seeing. And that's because with these elements being so large and needing to hold three of them, we really wanted to be able to maximize the space of the scoring mechanism in our robot. Now, if we had more time, I think we really would have considered going back and rebuilding this drivetrain to get these wheels closer together, both uh, lengthwise and widthwise, just to make parking in that base zone easier. This absolutely works. It can totally fit in that zone. It's just a little bit trickier to maneuver perfectly in endgame. Moving on to how our robot interacts with these artifacts. Now the artifacts are a five inch diameter wiffle ball and you're allowed to hold three of them. A really key way that we wanted to improve on the starter bot this year was the ability to create motifs, especially in autonomous. It is definitely an advantage for your robot to be able to start with three preloaded elements in the robot and then decide which one to fire as the exact pattern you create is randomized every match. And this double shooter approach allowed us to do that. This is definitely a weird way to think about this problem, but that's one of my favorite things that the Robot in Three Days allows us to do. We felt like this was a very effective way to solve the motif problem without having to create an incredibly complicated mechanism. Having two launchers is pretty much just as simple as having one launcher. And in this case, we actually still took a lot of inspiration from the starter bot. Now our launcher mechanism consists of a similar wheel system to the starter bot. 
On each side, we have two hog back wheels, one, two, three, and four. Each of those sets are bolted together before they get bolted to a hub, which is on one shaft that runs the width of that scoring mechanism. In addition to those hog back wheels, we also have a flywheel bolted to each of these assemblies. This is an unreleased part as of Robot in Three Days, but it adds a little more rotational inertia, which allows us to launch from that far zone without having to push our RPM from our motor up too high. One of the key components that allows us to have a consistent launcher, even with motor power being kind of variable because of battery voltage, is that we run the motors on this flywheel shooter with a velocity control program. So we are asking for a specific velocity out of the motors and they will dynamically apply as much power as necessary to keep that set velocity. So as motor voltage fluctuates from running out of other motors or as the match goes on, our flywheel launchers can always stay at the same relative velocity. These flywheels and their additional rotational inertia allow us to keep that velocity higher through launching the ball. Uh, you can transfer that same amount of kinetic energy without requiring the initial speed to be quite as high. Now this doesn't change our spin up speed very much, but it does allow us to play with our motor efficiency and our motor curves to be a little bit more advantageous. Now, Behind this channel here, there are two 6,000 RPM 5203 series motors. We have a few different 6,000 RPM motors that we offer at GoBuilda, and really any of them will do this job. Each of those have a two millimeter GT2 pulley, and they drive a belt, which goes to this common shaft between the two sides of the launcher. We really like two millimeter pitch timing belts here because it's a really good match for the amount of torque that the motor can produce. The motor with no gearbox can't put out very much torque at all, so it's very hard to skip the teeth on this belt. And because it is a small pitched belt, it also has very little friction or load independent loss required to spin it up. So it's a nice pairing for the amount of torque and power that comes from these motors. Before any of these artifacts interact with the flywheels themselves, they have to interact with our intake system. Our intake is made up of 48 millimeter gecko wheels all on a common shaft and driven by an 1150 RPM motor. Uh, this is a fairly high speed motor and we like that because it means that basically as soon as a, an artifact touches that intake, it's going into the robot. Uh, that really high velocity means that even if we're driving away from that artifact at the very moment we make contact, a lot of the times that intake can still pull it in. After it in, uh, comes in contact with these 48 millimeter gecko wheels, we also have a back, which is a 2106 steel shaft um, mounted on either side of our chassis, and it's got these intake rollers stretched over it. Now, this shaft in here doesn't spin. Uh, it's just a backing for our, our intake system to actually push that artifact up into the robot. And it needed some grip to stop the artifact from just rotating inside that intake. Once it is past the 48 millimeter gecko wheels, second shaft, which drives six 72 millimeter boot wheels. Now the second shaft is driven by a stretch of plastic chain. That way we don't need another motor dedicated to the second shaft. And this brings those artifacts from the very front of the intake up into being ready to be fed into the launcher. Now stopping them from going directly into the launcher is two 96 millimeter boot wheels per side. And now each of these are driven independently by their own super speed servo. It's important that this stage of the artifact handling in the robot is independent from the right and left side, because otherwise we won't have that control over which color elements to fire, which really would stop us from building those motifs, which is the big goal of this robot. We really wanted to put a robot forward that did a good job at solving that specific problem for this year's challenge. Once you have collected that first ball into either the left or the right side of the scoring mechanism, there is a torque servo with a U-beam that can rotate over. Now we call this the fork or the diverter, and this means that we can then collect the following artifacts into that other side of the robot. So here we've got a green artifact, we've moved the diverter over, and then we can pick up our purple artifact into the left side. Our third artifact will end up hanging out kind of in the middle, but it'll feed into the same side of the launcher as the second artifact selected. 
So oftentimes you'll grab one and then you'll grab two more of a different color. Our intake pulls double duty as a good way to interact with the gate. This kind of surprised us as it wasn't something we were thinking about in the design process, but it works great. The intake wheels provide a little bit of a cushion so it doesn't feel like we're just absolutely slamming the gate lever and it works very consistently. We can drive up and push on that lever with the intake with it being off and it always diverts and lets those artifacts down into the secret tunnel. It was honestly such a pleasure to have the Royal Society of Robots here in Winfield to create this robot, and I am very happy with how this robot in three days came together. If you're curious about specifics of this robot or the code we use to drive it, you can find that over on our website at gobuilda.com or in the description below. If you have questions about this robot or parts we sell on our website, feel free to shoot us an email over to sales at gobilda.com.